Okay, can everyone hear me? Yep. Okay, thanks for inviting me. Uh, we already saw this morning that high contrast imaging uh, by itself is an extremely powerful technique, especially when incorporating direct uh, spectroscopy measurements of exoplanets, and we'll uh, continue to gain a deeper understanding of that, I'm sure, as the, the week moves along and we hear uh, more talks. But it's interesting to consider how this technique might interface with already uh, other well-established methods like the Doppler radio velocity technique. Right? Can we assess how powerful those might be when um, operating together uh, in tandem, in unison uh, with one another? Right? We already know that radio velocity measurements are essential for maximizing the, the scientific output of transit observations, right? Simultaneous mass and radius measurements have effectively established uh, a new field of studying for the first time, the interiors of exoplanets and their bulk composition through these density measurements. And so it's interesting to ask the question, um, are there analogous benefits to be had when combining RVs with another technique like the one um, that this, con this uh, a conference focuses on, right? Is there any connection at all between these two seemingly distinct methods, right? At first glance, it doesn't seem to be the case because radio velocities is an indirect technique. You study the star, not the exoplanet. You, you, you infer the presence of the planet imaging as a direct technique. RVs are sensitive close to the star. Imaging is sensitive further away from the star. RVs operate strictly in and out of the plane of the sky where imaging is a projection onto the sky. And so it seems at first glance they're complementary to one another, if not completely orthogonal. And so what is the connection, uh, if any? And so this topic can be motivated through radio velocity accelerations or so-called uh, Doppler trends, uh, if you like. And so just looking at uh, this plot here, even though it's a partial cycle, a partial orbit, we know unambiguously that there is a companion lurking in the outskirts of HD 19467, and I will show you an image uh, of that companion momentarily. Uh, there's some body that is gravitationally interacting with its star and producing this measurable radio velocity trend. And so what's exciting is that as high contrast imaging sensitivities are, are improving and the techniques and methods, uh, observing methods, data reduction are, are, are maturing over time. As that's happening, the radio velocity teams have continued to acquire and accumulate more and more observations over spanning a very long time baseline and the precision is improving with time of these Doppler measurements, right? If you look at the scatter in the plot over here of these more recent observations, it's a bit smaller than back in the late 90s. And it would be even more of a market effect um, if this star didn't have so much uh, astrophysical jitter uh, associated with it. And also, this is with Keck High Res, which has been using the iodine gas cell for more than a decade. But in any case, right, it's, it's not uncommon for radio velocity teams to report hundreds of observations now for a single star. Maybe it's a multi-planet single, uh, maybe it's a multi-planet uh, system in, in a single publication. And so it's really interesting co to consider what kind of new science might arise at the interface, the boundary of these two methods, right? We, the, the, the most distant Doppler detected planet is around 6 AU. And meanwhile, Beta Pictoris B has been detected close to its star, so close that it plays peekaboo with the chronographic mask. Its semi-major axis is 9 AU. And so they were really starting to fill in this parameter space and connect uh, our understanding of inner solar systems to that of outer solar systems using techniques that were previously considered as non-overlapping. Right? And so I would like to discuss some of the exciting topics and, and research that's going on um, in this, this, this area, and I, I'll try to um, provide some of the details, you know, depending on how much time we have, for actually integrating uh, in a self-consistent manner these radio velocity and imaging data sets. And so what might be the motivation for looking at these radio velocity trends? Let's start talking about partial orbits first and then move on to full three-dimensional orbits. High detection efficiency, right? Uh, this morning, Beth Biller showed uh, a lot of surveys 
that have um, a handful of detections now, which are extremely important and we're following up those objects, but there are also a lot of non-detections. And so one might say, you know, why not start with an intrinsically companion-rich sample? You know something is tugging on the star. Maybe it turns out to be a binary on a face-on orbit, but you are going to discover some of these brown dwarfs and maybe really high mass uh, you know, super Jupiters, which are extremely important for our spectral models and evolutionary models. And so you immediately start with a very high uh, detection efficiency if you're looking at these radio velocity accelerations benefiting from the many years of Doppler observations standing on the shoulders of those observations, right? So I think that's pretty straightforward. If you continue to follow up the companion, let's say you image something, you can then do high contrast astrometry. I think we have an entire talk dedicated to that at the, at the conference at, at one of these days. Uh, this week, and you can break the cyanide degeneracy inherent to the radio velocity method, which is only, of course, providing minimum mass uh, information by itself. And then you can maybe construct a three-dimensional orbit. I will tell you when you are justified to try to start constructing a 3D orbit because it takes some time, and you should think carefully about that before you spend a lot of time trying to construct one from just a straight line, okay? If you can get that 3D orbit, then of course you get the dynamical mass of the companion. There's no ambiguity based on the evolutionary models, which we already mentioned where in, in imaging we measure the relative brightness of the companion, and then we use a model to infer a mass. Those models have not necessarily been calibrated in the range where you might be interested. Young ages, low temperatures, old ages, higher temperatures. Um, they, they, well, they are calibrated a little bit in that regime, but there's this whole parameter space, right, where there's um, uncertainty, certainly. And so you can explicitly calibrate these theoretical evolutionary models using Newton's laws. Can't argue with that. And so we really don't know the masses of the HR 8799 planets. If somebody said, you know, these guys are three Jupiters, I would say, yeah, sure, they're, they're nine, okay, yeah, one. Yeah, eh, maybe, all right. So we, you know, we trust them within a factor or two. In astrophysics, that's pretty good. It's pretty good, but we want better than that, right? We want to do precision astrophysics. And so in order to do that, you need additional dynamical information, which is very difficult to get for HR 8799 because it's face-on and it's young. And so you know, this is an extremely important system, but it sure would be nice to calibrate some of those models, maybe with another set of targets to then inform our understanding of uh, such of said systems. And so uh, Kappa Andromeda B, for example, we don't know whether to, make, whether to make it a lowercase b or a capital B, right? It's 13 Jupiter masses according to some age estimate, which is, is difficult to, uh, to ascertain. And then follow-up observations have suggested uh, that should probably be capital B. It's still being debated in the literature, and, and we're going to hear a talk about ages of stars um, uh, this week as well. And so this is, this is a, an important topic, and we would like to really know the masses of these companions. And then another topic, I hope I have time to get to this, this is something that I did not appreciate whatsoever until the data was actually right there on my computer, which is you can actually calculate the occurrence rate of gas giant planets at wide orbital separations beyond that which the radio velocity teams have established their time baselines. So not just 6 AU, but all the way out to roughly 20 AU by combining imaging and radio velocity measurements together. And it actually turns out that your non-detections are critical there. Okay? And so I will report some uh, very recent results uh, on that topic at the end of the talk. So partial orbits. What information can we actually get from a partial orbit? Well, if you have this type of radio velocity acceleration and you get a direct image, you can get the minimum dynamical mass right away. Just using Newton's laws, you can write down the equations and you can actually calculate the minimum mass based on the measured angular separation and the radio velocity acceleration, the instantaneous radio velocity acceleration, which this system shows a little bit of curvature, this system shows a lot of curvature, and this one has very, very subtle wiggles maybe, but it's basically a straight line. So analyzing those accelerations 
uh, during your direct detection can give you the minimum dynamical mass. And you can, um, if you want to, you can get the approximate true physical separation of the companion at the instant in which you uh, directly imaged it. So you write down Newton's uh, equations, basically, and you massage those equations, and you find that because it's an inverse square law, you get a square here, and you need to know the distance to the star, and you measure with your high contrast instrument the angular separation. That tells you the minimum mass of the companion based on that acceleration and your initial discovery epoch. Why doesn't the mass of the star show up in this equation? It's, it's embedded in the acceleration. Right? And it's, 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 it's embedded in your measurement of the acceleration of the star. And so, uh, yeah, it, if you um, then write down basically the same equations and look at it from a geometric perspective, and just draw lines basically between your primary star and your secondary, your discovery, and then your line of sight. You can um, just draw triangles, and you can relate the acceleration to these observables and then solve for, this is the true instantaneous uh, physical separation of the companion, R sub, the distance between your A and B component based on the uh, parallax and the angular separation. And this depends on your, so this one is approximate, this one is not approximate, in the, in the sense that this is model dependent, so you have to estimate the mass of the companion, but it goes as, as the square, uh, you know, R depends on that as the square root, and so it's not terribly sensitive. So, you can, so the bottom line is that you can calculate explicitly a minimum dynamical mass, and then you can get a very good handle on the true physical separation at that time. And so the next question is, okay, what does one need to calculate a full orbit? Right, when you model radial velocities, it turns out that these are nominally the free parameters, and then astrometry, um, since it's in two dimensions instead of one dimension, gives you uh, more free parameters to, to play with, and it, it puts constraints on more, uh, uh, more of the orbit. And so how much information do you really need to calculate the, uh, the, the, the dynamical mass, the full three-dimensional orbit? And so let's say that we have a radial velocity time series that started here, and then there was a direct imaging discovery based on the acceleration, and then we continued to follow it up. Right? That's the, the scenario that we want to discuss. When do the constraints become important? Well, if you want to get a handle on the total mass of the system, you need to measure the semi-major axis and the orbital period. And then if you want to get a handle on the mass of the companion, you have to know something about the mass of the star. I'll show a, an analysis uh, similar to, to this situation in a moment where we calculated the mass of a star by measuring its radius directly using Chara interferometry, so the system up there on the hill. So you have, to, you have to have a good handle on the star if you want to get a dynamical mass of your companions. And notice that the parallax is absolutely essential because it comes in as a cube uh, relating to your total dynamical mass. And so how much data do you need? Well, it depends on who you ask. Andy Bowden says, he works here, uh, I don't trust anyone's results until I see two complete phase wraps. He's looking at pre-main sequence binaries that are about 140 parsecs away. And to scale, these are the uncertainties compared to the size of the orbit. Right? And so you don't want to wait a very, very long time to calculate these dynamical masses. And so he's basically saying, well, I want to see your systematic errors. I want you to go around twice and then see if the second revolution agrees with the first. And then Jessica Liu, who studies the black hole at the center of the galaxy says, yeah, the inclination just falls right out. And Bernstein and Kushalani say, with accuracies of a few milliarc seconds when uh, we're studying comets, it's possible to place strong constraints on KBO orbits even from very short, e.g. 24-hour arcs. Reflex motion is easily detected given a measurement and distance to the target in less than an hour. 
Okay, and so what's going on here is this orbit, of course, looks like that with your error bars compared to the size of your, it's a signal to noise thing, right? So it does depend on who you're talking to. And so the question is, well, where do we fall with this signal to noise? Um, and in high contrast imaging, we're right about there. So we have to be careful. Um, we're not gonna get instant gratification, but it is reasonable on a reasonable time scale to actually get um, uh, you know, interesting constraints on the orbits of companions, not just saying the eccentricity is somewhere between zero and 0.9. Okay. And so um, after talking to these three individuals, I decided to do some simulations uh, of this effect, right, with, with high contrast imaging uh, uh, being the, the application. And so you can see that uh, in this case, you know, Jessica is not far off and saying, yes, the inclination falls right out. You only need a handful of measurements. And so this is, this is plotted versus the astrometric phase coverage. So this is a tenth of an orbit. And you're already nailing the inclination in this simulation. I changed all the parameters and I could pull it out almost, well, I could pull it out every single time. The inclination converged very quickly for these kind of observations where your uncertainty in astrometry is basically set by the pixel size which is around 10 milli arc seconds, and let's say that you're imaging something at half an arc second or an arc second, right? Characteristic size scales. And this is how the uncertainty and the inclination is improving over time. Likewise, the mass is converging. Once you break that sinai degeneracy, the mass is converging to the, um, in, in this blind experiment, to the actual value in around a tenth of a phase wrap, depending on what kind of of uncertainty you're interested in, in acquiring. So, you know, let's say that the, the model uncertainties from, from evolutionary models is, is good to, to 30% or something, you're starting to dip down below that in just a tenth of an orbit. And so this is, this is promising that um, we actually don't need the full orbit, like in the pre-main sequence binary cases, it would be ideal if we did, but we can actually ex extrude useful information with partial periods, partial cycles. And it's because the signal to noise of the astrometry is 100 to 1, and so are the Doppler radio velocities for bright stars that are 30 parsecs away. And so even though the period here is 150 years, you can, in, in 10 or 15 years, you can really pin down this observation, this, the, or this mass measurement, it sounds like a long period of time, but the RV folks have already provided many years of observations for all the nearby bright stars, essentially. Okay, so the, a lot of those observations are already in hand, and I assume quite reasonable uncertainties for the Doppler measurements. And so how do we actually fit these observations in a self-consistent way? Well. We nominally use Bayesian analysis. How many people have used Bayesian statistics, this, this framework, before? Okay, um, so you start with Bayes' theorem, which you can derive in two lines of algebra. Okay, just starting from logic, and I, I recommend that you buy this book, a Bayesian tutorial by Sivia. It's a great book and explains a lot of the, um, the big picture, but also the idiosyncrasies associated with doing Bayesian analysis. And we assume that we understand the uncertainties. Okay, we assume that the measurement um, errors are actually representative of, of what they, they are in reality. Let's say they have a Gaussian distribution. That's, that's an assumption that's normally made. Uh, maybe there's some skewedness or asymmetries there, but we have some approximation for how these uncertainties behave in practice. And you can, of course, plot these with your Doppler measurements and your astrometry measurements which normally have different systematics than the former. Then we use a Keplerian fit. Say you start with a single system, and we uh, model. We use a Keplerian model with the true anomaly and a eccentric anomaly and all of these parameters, and we derive what the radial velocity is in time and what the orbit is in time, and we vary those parameters to try to find the best fit. And then we explore this many dimensional parameter space to try to, find, to try to derive rigorous uncertainties 
And this is what Bayesian analysis allows you to do. It allows you to extract not just the best fit, but also get the uncertainties in all of your parameters. There's, there's seven or eight parameters, depending on uh, how, many nuisance, um, how many nuisance parameters you might have, for getting the mass and the full orbit. So you cannot code that up brute force in your computer. You cannot go to seven dimensions and explore the eccentricity with 100 uh, samples and then the longitude of the ascending node with 100 samples and then the periastron passage with 100 samples. You just run out of, of computing power very quickly. And then after you coded this up in seven dimensions and you used a supercomputer, you realize, oh, there's a radio velocity offset because in, in this year they switched instruments. And so now I have another parameter, uh-oh, that's degenerate with my radio velocity semi-amplitude. So I have to be really careful. Okay, and so that's when you start to look at this, um, this tool called Markov Chain Monte Carlo. And so this technique, how many people have heard of Markov Chain Monte Carlo? Good, 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 good. So um, this technique, of course, is powerful because the amount of computations in principle grows linearly with the number of free parameters. And so it's a general method that doesn't really care about the details of your model, but it can efficiently explore these many dimensional parameter spaces. And so you've got at least you know, the period eccentricity inclination um, argument of periastron, time of periastron passage, which is telling you where your planet is at a given time, longitude of the ascending node, and then all of these nuisance parameters um, such as the, radio, the, the global radio velocity offset and then maybe the differential radio velocity offset, um, you can actually go up to much higher dimensions in gravitational microlensing, uh, which is a completely different model. There's dozens of parameters. And the first time that I did MCMC, I was working in 21 dimensions. I do not recommend <laughs> going straight to 21 dimensions. So I ended up backing off of that and fitting a straight line, then fitting a Keplerian orbit with the RVs only, and then doing the astrometry, and then including the nuisance parameters, right? So that's kind of how uh, one does this in, in practice with gradually making the analysis uh, somewhat more uh, complete and rigorous and time consuming. And so this is a movie just showing radio velocity data. Let's see if this works of a Markov chain Monte Carlo fit. And so we're exploring parameter space here, allowing all those variables, all those parameters to vary. And I've got, I've got a, an offset between instruments. And so this is the same object, but this instrument was installed at some later time or it had a detector upgrade or something like that happened, some uh, pragmatic thing that you need to account for. And so there's a global offset, differential offset, and this is just radio velocity data. Um, by itself, but you can see that with, you can have a decent guess, right, your initial guess is that the semi-amplitude is not thousands of meters per second, but smaller than that. It's basically finding the sweet spot in your n-dimensional data and dancing around in that sweet spot and exploring the posterior distribution and telling you the probability density for each one of these parameters that you are varying. And so within this framework, one, I don't know how deeply to go into this, but one nominally uses a Metropolis Hastings algorithm, which um, at first glance looks somewhat complicated, but it actu it's actually not that many lines of code. It's 10 or 20 lines of code, and it's, all, it's essentially independent of your model. Your model comes in and says, what's the likelihood? What's the likelihood? What's the likelihood? And you do that over and over again, running it through the Metropolis Hastings algorithm, which is telling you how to randomize the situation. And so you basically ask the question, is the likelihood now better than it was before? And you go through and fill in these gaps. If it is, then you record New, those new parameters, period, eccentricity, inclination, so on and so forth, and you record a chain of these as your iterations accumulate, and that is basically telling you your posterior distribution. And so um, then you ask, okay, if the likelihood is not 
bigger than I want to accept, this is the clever part, I want to accept this, this chain based on a, a randomization. So you call a random number generator, and if you look at this closely enough, you can convince yourself that this is a way of stepping back on the problem and saying, I can actually figure out the posterior distribution as I march along in this n-dimensional parameter space, because after some time, I can actually sample this enough that I can fill in those valleys and rifts in, the, um, in this complicated parameter space without actually uh, specifying very much beforehand except just a model, okay? So this is really powerful. Um, and you can read uh, a paper by Eric Ford, actually 2005 is a really great uh, tool, uh, a really great uh, article that explains the Metropolis-Hastings algorithm in detail for radio velocity observations. You can then um, uh, uh, combine that with astrometry just by modifying the likelihood parameter. So let's do an example. This is HR7672. It's a famous brown dwarf or a famous brown dwarf in my circles. Um, so it was discovered by Mike Liu in 2001, 2002. It was directly imaged based on this long-term radio velocity systemic trend. And when I was at Caltech, I noticed, hey, this thing has, has turned over. There's some curvature there. There's a change in the acceleration. Uh, the derivative of the chain of acceleration is called the jerk for some reason, right? It's, there's a change in the acceleration. That's telling us something unique about the, the solution. We might be able to construct the orbit now. And so there was astrometry, which again had very high signal to noise. And so I went out and I got another astrometric data point to try to test this code to see, okay, how well can we actually figure out the eccentricity. If you stare at this long enough, you can actually tell that it does have a high eccentricity. And so in case you're not appreciating this long time baseline, this is an image of, the, of, of me circa second grade when the first data was coming in from the radio velocity team. So I'm benefiting from all of these uh, you know, previous measurements. So this is my, uh, my Keck NERC 2 image. Tomorrow we're going to have a workshop that I, I will show you how to process, uh, uh, how to squash speckles do using PSF subtraction. And so this is an image from 2011 showing the companion, which if you squint and already know where it should be, then you can convince yourself that it's there. But after PSF subtraction, it pops out, okay? And so this is the new measurement. And so we had these discovery epochs, and it's not a surprise that the companion was imaged very close to its greatest elongation, right? That's not a, uh, an accident. And then there were some more measurements. There was some observation at Palomar where they were doing an experiment and changed the point scale drastically. But yeah, you just included everything in, in the data. And then here's my observation right here. So this is very precise measurement, uh, a little bit smaller than the size of a pixel. And I put this on Astro PH, and I said, here is the answer. Yes, we have the orbit. We can actually get the whole orbit and get the whole mass. Here are the results. This is a very interesting brown dwarf for these reasons. And uh, a talented graduate student from the, the IFA in Hawaii emailed me, Brendan Bowler, who's now a postdoc here at Caltech. And he said, Justin, really nice paper. Um, I noticed that you know, there's this big gap here in the data. Wouldn't it be nice if there were observations there? And he said, there is, uh, I think it was, Gem there's Gemini data, Gemini South. And I said, I thought that was just too far to, too far and low a declination to even include. I didn't even look at that. And so um, I analyzed the, the data with this new measurement in hindsight, and so accidentally did a, a blind experiment, and it landed right where it should, right when it should. And so I was 99% confident of this beforehand, and whew, Okay, yes, this, def this is definitely, definitely, definitely working, okay? And so these are the posterior distributions. This is what the Markov chain analysis will allow you to figure out. All of the orbit parameters, they're roughly Gaussian. There are some tails here, which is nice. Uh, uh, the Bayesian analysis can uh, incorporate very complicated posteriors, double peaked, anything that you can imagine it can handle, it's a, it's a matter of exploring that parameter space. Thanks. And so this is the result, this is the mass of the companion. It's good to 
4% fractional error. Okay, so this now we're starting to do precision astrophysics and uh, constrain theoretical evolutionary models, and there's some interesting results in the literature now. Uh, Trent Dupuy, for example, has looked at um, the other orbits of other brown dwarfs and finding that our evolutionary models seem to underpredict their luminosities by about a factor of two, and it turns out that this also happens with HR 7672. So at the 50th Jupiter level, um, or 50 or 60, 60 at Jupiter level, uh, and, and even below, there, we seem to be uncovering factors of two discrepancies in the brown dwarf evolutionary models already. We haven't made it to the, the Jupiters yet. Okay? And so there, there are interesting uh, interplays between observations and theory here. And so this is more accurate and precise than theoretical evolutionary models. Uh, this is another way of looking at the mass. This is the final distribution after you account for parallax uncertainty and uncertainty in the mass of the star. And I mentioned that we measured the mass um, by measuring its radius through uh, char observations. And so based on, based on this initial success, I decided it was a good idea to do a high contrast campaign at Keck and Palomar. Uh, it's called TRENDS. Uh, which stands for uh, Targeting Benchmark Objects with Doppler Spectroscopy. It's a very convoluted acronym. I'm not good at making up acronyms, but the, the word describes what we're doing, right? We're basically following up these systems that show long-term accelerations. And so this is based at Keck and now also uh, uh, Palomar, where we get spectroscopy from Project 1640 for the companions that we have already directly imaged. And so this is kind of a panorama of the systems uh, provided by the California Planet Search, where we have these long-term accelerations. Right? So there's a lot of um, liners, we call them. There's systems that have sinusoids plus an acceleration. There's, there's systems that show um, curvature already. You get the point. And so I'll just highlight um, our most interesting discoveries. So we have two very interesting discoveries uh, one is HD114174 for uh, a while. Um, I, I was convinced that this companion was a brown dwarf because its brightness and colors were consistent with a, a somewhat mid-T range uh, uh, type brown dwarf. It looked and smelled like a brown dwarf, but it turns out when I calculated the minimum dynamical mass from the astrometry and the Doppler observations using those equations that I showed previously, it was more than a quarter of a solar mass. And so that was curious, and then I, I, I decided, okay, what could mimic that? Well, let's look at the infrared colors of white dwarfs, compact objects. And indeed, they are also consistent with your infrared observations. And so this is actually a compact object. It's a white dwarf, and uh, this is a follow-up observation, which uh, my student Chris Matthews is going to tell you about in a pop session, but we had a, a non-detection in the L-band at Keck and then followed it up at the LBT and uh, were able to then get J, H, K, and L and constrain the SED, figure out the temperature, which tells you something about the cooling age of the white dwarf, right? By the way, this is the deepest mid-infrared L-band image ever taken in the history of man uh, inside of one arc second. HR 8799B is slightly fainter, but further away. And we find, looking at the cooling age, again, I'm just glossing over the details here, but the white dwarf cooling age appears to be at the kind of two sigma level, discrepant with the estimated age of the primary star. And so this is still an outstanding mystery, and there are a few possible explanations, but um, we're not sure which one is correct yet, so this is still ongoing. And I'll just also mention that um, Zerlo et al. have also discovered um, serendipitously a companion around HD 8049, which was a compact object. And so we're finding these things by accident using radio velocity accelerations. This is the other companion that's very interesting. This is the original, this is the initial uh, plot that I showed you earlier in the talk. HD 19467 is a brown dwarf. It's a bona fide brown dwarf. I did not get fooled this time. Um, it uh, orbits a G star, and so we understand G stars very well. So we can infer the metallicity of the companion. We can calculate the minimum dynamical mass, and we can get a handle on the age from our observations of the star, again, placing it on 
an HR diagram. It's very similar to the sun. And um, because it's, it's uh, subsolar and metallicity, we know uh, based on its location in the HR diagram that it's going to be older than the sun. And uh, there are more interesting constraints coming uh, along the way with these with follow-up observations. We do have a spectrum from Project 1640 now in hand. And you can see this photometry-wise, it's consistent with a T-dwarf. Um, oh, this is Aaron. So, so I, <laughs> I, I put the paper on the archive, and then I sent it to Keck, and I said, look at this discovery. Isn't it neat? And they said, yeah, we should do, we should, you know, do um, uh, we, we, press release, thank you. And, and they said, but you've got to change the image. I, did, I sent them a black and white image. And they said, this looks too much like a scientific image. <laughs> I said, OK. And so I went into MATLAB, and in five minutes, I, turned the, I changed the color scale to autumn or something like that. And then I sent it back immediately. And they're like, oh, yeah, that's great. That's exactly what we wanted right there. And so <laughs> anyways, and then somebody went through the hassle of making an artist's impression. Of, so you know, spatially resolved, this is what it would look like. Anyways, so this was a fun discovery and, and it's still ongoing. I think it's going to be an important object because we can finally get a handle on multiple parameters, age, mass, uh, chemical composition at the same time. And of course, though we're gonna, our ignorance in those parameters is going to decrease in time. And so we have a spectrum now from Project 1640. I think there's another poster about this by Jonathan Ag Aguilar. And it looks like it's a T8 dwarf that shows methane. We are sensitive to super Jupiters with this trends program. And so this is a plot showing if you image the companion at a given separation, what would its minimum dynamical mass be compared to the red curve, which is your actual sensitivity with a high contrast instrument based on its age. And so super, super Jupiters are not out of the question uh, in the near term. And so we're looking to find the first Y dwarf that um, is similar, uh, at least in terms of our ability to constrain all these parameters compared to HD194, 6, 7, and others. OK, last topic, non-detections. Right? What do you do with those? We don't always find a companion when we have a radial velocity acceleration. Well, you can make this plot where you constrain the mass and the orbital period by combining it with imaging. Right? Imaging eliminates this top right-hand portion of the plot where you have high mass and long periods. You can imagine combining other techniques, aperture masking, and all the while the high contrast imaging teams are continuing to improve their sensitivity, and the Doppler teams are continuing to eat away at that parameter space. As the trend persists, you know that the mass and period must be uh, increasing if you don't see any change or curvature in that rate, radial velocity curve. And so you can determine gas giant planet rates by, in, by inferring the presence of planets by eliminating the possibility of brown dwarfs, which are rare anyway, something like 3% around FG and K stars, versus stars. And so the planets can run, but they cannot hide. Right? You can infer their presence. And so um, a graduate student uh, at Caltech, uh, Ben Monte, looked at all of the M dwarfs within the California planet search. And we had uh, a number of detections and non-detections. I will just report the three conclusions from that paper. Conclusion number one, the occurrence rate of gas giant planets from 1 to 13 Jupiters is 6.5%, plus or minus a little bit, around M stars from 0 to 20 AU. And we did this uh, through a statistical method of figuring out the probability distributions in mass and period for 111 objects with simultaneous mass, I'm sorry, with simultaneous Doppler and imaging observations. And so this could possibly explain why imaging discoveries are found preferably, preferably around more massive stars. There's not many detections at all around M stars. Conclusion number two, the occurrence rate metallicity correlation appears to hold at wider separations. All of the detections of planets, although indirect, were around metal-rich stars, which is arbitrarily defined as those greater than minus 0.10. And so for, we weren't able to make a gray histogram because we have no detections for M stars that have low metallicity, which we can get to about 0.1 dex or so. Uh, and so we had to put exclusion limits here. So at three sigma, the occurrence rate of low, of, of gas giant planets around low metallicity M stars 
is very, very low, less than 0.03. And so this might be evidence for core accretion beyond the snow line. And finally, uh, conclusion number three is that our results are consistent with gravitational microlensing. And so um, I'm running out of time, so I'll, you can read Ben's paper to look at the details of that comparative analysis. Thanks. The, the question is, um, I'm surprised that you can't brute force uh, this problem. Um, you can brute force it up to six or seven dimensions if you have a lot of patience. And the problem is that in this data set in particular, um, there were seven radio velocity offsets from changes in the instrument architecture in the past. And so I wasn't just working in 10 dimensions. It, it ramped all the way up to 20 dimensions because I also had to take into account our ignorance of the uncertainties themselves. And so um, my supercomputer was a multi-core desktop with 12 nodes, something like that. Um, but yeah, you can certainly throw n-body uh, simulations at this problem uh, as, as well and try to predict the, locate, the exact location of the companion. It's, and it's only a two-body problem. So um, I just don't do brute force above five or six dimensions. And when I tell people I do brute force at five or six dimensions, they say that I'm crazy. <laughs>